See, I'm going to Washington next week, and the idea is part of this group of people with the rebuild North Bay that formed after the fires in you know, Santa Rosa and all that area, and in Redwood Valley, Potter Valley, and here. Um, and so we're going, like, there's a person, a supervisor from Napa, from Sonoma, from Lake, and Mendocino County. And then there's also some private industry people, and we're all going, and hopefully we'll have some impact with FEMA. We're meeting with FEMA, with HUD, and with the Transportation Committee of Congress to, to state our case about why, why we need the money, why they're holding it up, and, um, and do a pitch for more money to help rebuild. So, that's going to be the last part of this one. And, and so anyway, that's it for my comments. If you have any comments, you know, or questions, or anything, now is the time. Thanks for coming out again. John, I'm going to get ready to get a shake with the fuel break uh, going up Pine Mountain, too, from the reservoir up to uh, Old Boy Scout Road. You didn't mention whether that's still uh, happening. Okay. Yeah, and that certainly, that's the question was about the fuel breaks up in Pine Mountain area. And Cal Fire has been working on that, and they were, I went to a, a meeting they had a couple weeks ago with Chief Todd Patton explaining what they were doing, and they're trying to connect you know, from 101 over to Tonkai Road. And so they're, they're progressing, and they got agreements from all the landowners except one. So they're going to just go and then skirt around that one piece and keep going and create this big fuel break up there. So. Matt. Hey, would you comment on what's happening at the county on the end of this? So anyway, there's a, there's a lot of movement in the, the cannabis program. Let's see, we got the transferability passed, and that allows the person who has a permit to transfer it to another person who wants to get into the system. Um, but there's been this latest idea about enterprise zones, which was, <clears throat> we're moving it, oh, taking a step back, we closed off phase one, did it? just finished like a week ago. And so people who were heritage or legacy growers who were before 2016, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. If you're in a resource land that you're, um, those are off limits at this point. And so the idea was that they wanted to create these enterprise zones or innovation zones, they're calling them because there's people like over in the coastal area that are getting sunsetted out of their, their areas because they're in a more or less a residential area. So they have to move. We gave them, I think, another year and a half to move. And so we're looking at an area over in Fort Bragg that they could kind of move to because there's very few areas in the coastal zone where people can cultivate do all that. Um, so that was kind of the original idea that I thought was happening. But then when it came up in the board that there, it was this proposal to go from one to ten acre areas and that they would be these inner innovation zones and that a person could, or entity or whatever, could have up to ten acres of cultivation or mixed or residential manufacturing, distribution, cultivation, all on a 10-acre plot. And so, and then another part of that was because it would re require an EIR, you know, an environmental impact report would have to be developed for these entity or these innovation zones that, that it would be very costly and that those entities would then pay for the, the cost of this EIR 
beforehand, so it was thrown out there that they'd be paying $100,000 each to be able to, to play in this system. And so, so I voted against it because I just didn't think that that was the way that we wanted to move forward. It was too quick. It was, you know, it was giving the... Um, it was putting it all on a, the people who could afford $100,000 up front to pay for these fees. So, so we'll see. The board voted in favor of it, and it went, it's going back to, to planning and building, you know, the cannabis department. But they were also um, having a series of meetings. So they had one the other weekend down in Ukiah, which there's a couple hundred people there. But then they're going to have one in each district to, to get the people's input on how they feel about it. And certainly, we, if they proceed with that, we need to make sure that the communities are involved in that process of, of you know, saying what they want their communities to look like, too. Because the 10-acre you know, grow site is, is a huge, huge endeavor. It might have been four to one. Yeah, I asked, I asked what the vote was. Um, with he was voting no, but I wanted to know what the margin of the vote. And apparently, it was four to one. Sarah, is there still no idea yet where the cannabis innovation zones would be, is, or is, has the proposal kind of cleared out now or become clear? I haven't heard anything about specific specific sites or anything. They've talked about ten of those sites. Sarah might know. Hi, I'm Sarah Bodner, and I work with Henry's Original, which is a cannabis brand that's based in Laytonville. And we're um, the largest employer in northern Mendocino County. We have cultivation, and we also have a flower brand that sells throughout the state. And we're involved in working with the county and the board in this discussion around what could these enterprise zones or innovation zones look like. And um, you know, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things, because this, and, and also to say that this is all very much under development. The board direction was to send all of this um, to county staff to explore it and look into what it could look like. So nothing is really firm yet around these proposals. The, some of the intentions around it is to move cannabis into agriculturally appropriate areas. So moving it out of neighborhoods and out of resource lands to places where normalized agriculture exists. And to, in, you know, the, one of the thrusts behind this is for companies like ours that buy from all the area farmers, like we just don't have enough supply right now to build a viable Mendocino brand. So we're a 100% Mendocino company and like all of the flour that we put in the market comes from Mendocino. And with a lot more demand, um, not only our company, but other companies that are located here in Willits and in Redwood Valley, Flocana, and, and your neighbors here at the Canna Park, Leaf and Boxcar, like we, we want to buy as much cannabis as we can here in Mendocino County, and there's simply not enough. Like, um, I was speaking with Micah from Leaf earlier today, and they said they spend a million dollars a month on cannabis from Santa Barbara or other areas that they would love to be buying here and be part of the economic development picture of Mendocino County, but our current caps on cultivation make it really impossible. So the idea is to increase the supply we have here in Mendocino County to support, you know, these um, leakages, like we're spending money elsewhere and we're manufacturing products that are carrying the Mendocino name and selling them throughout the state. Um, so yes, the where is we want to move it to appropriate zones, and that's like a conversation with the county staff about where would that be. And um, the question of you know cost, I want to speak to that specifically. It's not yet clear how much the EIR is going to cost, and the the idea is the cost would be shared by all the applicants, and that it would be open for applicants who want to any current permit holders in Mendocino County like who are in the current permitting system could apply, not just large companies. Um, and there would be no new outside companies that would be included in this. So this is not like an invitation for large companies to come in and start doing large scale cultivation. It would be existing operators that have all been brought in under the current permitting system could scale up to one to 10 acres in that range based on the appropriateness of the land that they're looking at. And that once we determine the cost of the EIR, when we look at all the parcels that we want to include and the environmental impact study that would need to be done, 
then that cost would be divvied up proportional to how much people want to grow. So there's a lot of variables in this, and the whole picture hasn't yet come together. There's no exact dollar amounts on it, but this is not a cost that the county can bear. Like, the county can't afford to do the environmental impact study, so the cultivators that want to increase would incur that cost kind of proportional to what they're growing. All right. Yeah, Paul. So my question to the county is, I, I spent some time uh, a couple weeks ago, and I, I went to the planning department, and I went to the ag commissioner, and I tried to get an answer on uh, data, data of cumulative impacts of uh, the grows in the county. So, I, you know, it's very important to me because you, you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you're at at the moment. So when we look at the uh, sites that are in the, in the county, I don't know exactly how many sites there are, but in Humboldt County, they're taking a resource, um, a resource approach instead of a complaint process approach. Our county generally handles uh, enforcement and, um, and problem, problem grows um, by complaint, and I think that's a backwards approach. I think we need to take, the county needs to look at the uh, carrying capacity of the environment. When, when, I'm, when I mean carrying capacity, I mean wildlife, aquifer, um, anything, you know, ponds, uh, creeks, streams. And I think that if we don't get the answers to those basic questions, then how can we expand anywhere until we actually get those answered? So um, when I went to the county, there is no data. And we've been in the program now for a few years now. So all of the grows that are in the county right now that are permitted, I can't find any data that gives us any, any kind of negative, positive, any kind of feedback regarding this. So my question is to the county is uh, before we expand anywhere, I want to know what the effects are going to be currently right now. We should be having a baseline um, looking at what the impacts are to our streams and aquifers right now. And if we can't, if somebody can't give us those numbers, I mean, that's just common business sense is like, how do you expand into a, now, how, does, how do you expand into the 10-acre parcels when you don't even know what one acre is doing? And the other thing is in Humboldt County, they, uh, they take the code enforcement approaches that they go over, they do flyovers and they look at how many sites are in a given drainage or ecosystem or you know, area. And then they have Fish and Wildlife Service and other professionals come in and, and assess the, the, uh, the water tables, you know, as much as they can, the hydrology and then the creeks, uh, the temperatures of the creeks, and the flows of the creeks. They use historical data that they've had in the past because, you know, the trout streams and things that they have to monitor. So I don't know if everybody knows, but it's 54 degrees is where trout thrive in. If it's any warmer than that, they get gill rot. They develop flukes and things like that. The other thing we're having now is there's a phenomenon in the county that with these blue-green algae blooms that are happening in streams, that we think that um, it's affecting the deer population negatively um, through, through toxins. So um, since we're in a drought situation, we have catastrophic fires happening frequently, um, adding another giant commercial industry that's going to utilize water from aquifer and from streams or wells or whatever that, I just really think that we better have the answers now to what our situation is, the carrying capacity of our environment now, before we go jumping into 10 acres. If, if you guys can't answer that question, I'm definitely gonna oppose that because it's just common sense, so. Yeah, you made some good points there about, about the county, because the, they didn't do an EIR for the whole cannabis program, they did this, what they call a, a mitigated negative deck declaration saying that because we had all these cannabis growers in the hill, that it wasn't going to know, affect the overall environment if we permitted them. And it actually, if people were permitted, it would help out because then we could see what actually they were doing. So um, there's some good points. But going back to the big picture with the cannabis is that I told, I'm in agreement that I don't think our county's ready for the expansion mode. And, and what I'm trying to do is get people together to look at co-op mo models for the small cannabis growers. And so I've contacted this professor over at UC Davis who's 
and uh, prof he's a professor of economic development for communities, and his focus is on co-ops. And I've gotten a, we're having a phone conference with supervisors from um, Humboldt County, Trinity County, and then also people who are into the economic development model. And we've got some growers and distributors who are going to be on this call. And so what we're hoping to do is kind of, instead of jumping into opening it up for the big corporations to try to get an economically viable way for the small growers to, to exist in this world. So, so. you know, uh, and, you know getting, getting to that question, it's, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's corporate versus mom and pop or legacy or heritage or whatever you want to call that. It's really simply carrying capacity of the environment. If you can have one commercial grow in somewhere and they're legit and they're not, they're not having any byproducts that are going in the environment, they're not draining. I mean, we don't even have a baseline. The ag department and the planning department are deer in the headlights with regards to where we are right now. And so um, I don't think it's a matter of small grows, multiple small grows in an area or one commercial grow. I just think that we have to study the area first, f find out in a drought situation or in a normal situation, we need to know what that creek can handle and what those fish need and what those deer need and what the other critters in the area need. Because if we don't have that idea, we're just going blind and we all know how that's going to end up. Thanks for that comment, Paul. And um, one thing that this EIR would do is for the first time study the entire, of cumul the entire cumulative impact of the cannabis industry. Like what we're proposing is to fund an EIR that would look at the entire cannabis program for the first time, which hasn't been done. And that's actually compromising um, the well-being of the area's cannabis farmers currently because we're subject to um, not getting annual licenses from the state because of not having, because of the mitigated neg deck and not having this comprehensive environmental review done. So excellent point. And I also just want to say we're not talking about large corporations. This expansion zone would be available to all applicants in the current permitting system and would allow many of our area small farms that are simply not viable at 10,000 square feet with the cost of regulation, over-regulation, and taxation, and they would have the ability to scale up. It would also allow some larger companies to scale further, create more jobs, and really be the economic engine that, the, that, we, that our county needs the cannabis industry to be. Okay, Supervisor, I'm John Alameda. You probably know me. Worked for the county for 21 years. Lived here for over 60 years. I have three items. I want to bring up two of them. One of them is PG&E. We were real lucky this shutoff period that we weren't included here in the city of Willits and probably the city of Ukiah also. In the spring, PG&E met here at the city council and gave them the spiel on what things were going to happen. And of course, we've heard more since then. At that time, I brought up an idea about having a big generator at the substation out here so that everybody in the world wouldn't be buying these little generators and causing a fire problem. So I brought you a picture of what one of these looks like. And there's room for two semis. They, they sit on a semi-trailer, and there's room for two of them out there. They're expensive, but not as expensive as some of the projects that's been done around here. And it'll be a lot safer for the fire departments if they don't have to deal with individuals having accidents, plus people lose an inventory. There was $2 billion in California loss in this last shutoff. $2 billion of the product. Luckily, Willits didn't lose. But Safeway, you talk to them, you talk to Grocery Outlet, they have no generators to keep things going. If you need a prescription, you can't get a prescription because everything shuts down. So there needs to be some work with either the county, the city, or maybe both to help get the situation to where we can have a generator that they can just turn on. So I want to give you a picture of what it looks like. And you can share it with Madge. Because I didn't make two pictures of it. But there's room out there at that substation. to have two of these. And that's what a used one sold for at the Ritchie Brothers auction. It sold for 75000 bucks. So if it was 200,000 bucks for a new one and it could keep this thing, this town going, be well worth it. 
1,360. Yeah, there's room for two of them out there. It'll light up a city. It'll keep a city going. Well, and you got to have people that need fuel. You got people that need uh, they need the gas stations. They need uh, medical supplies. I use a CPAP machine myself, so I don't want to see electricity go out. So I would like you to look into it because that substation's in the county. It's not in the city. It's on Center Valley Road. Right. So you know you might start. We might start this here in, in Willits. And it might get popular in the city of Ukiah, might want to do it for their electric, because they're considered one customer down there. So that's what you look into. They're not terribly expensive to where it wouldn't be viable. It would keep a lot of uh, potential accidents from happening from people running generators that don't know nothing about it and don't know how to wire it. The other thing is, everybody nowadays has their PG&E meter, most everybody does, that's red somewhere else. You don't see meter readers coming out anymore. If there's that kind of, I'm trying to keep it down so it doesn't break up, so I'm holding it lower. If you, uh, if you have the technology for a meter reader not have to come out, there's got to be technology that can be either developed or it's there. When a line breaks, it automatically shuts that power off. You know, like these ones coming over tier two and tier three areas that they're worried about and that's why they're doing the shutoffs. If we have the technology to read people's meters without having a meter reader, they got the technology or can develop it to once that line breaks and pops, it shuts it off automatically. And that would solve a lot of problems too. So we need to do more discussion because PG&E is arrogant. I read the paper when they came to your last board meeting and what did the man say? He said, we don't work for the County of Mendocino Board of Supervisors. Isn't that what he said? Basically, Pretty arrogant, yeah. wasn't it? Well, you yeah. know what? I pay my bill, and they work for me, and you're my representative, so they work for you because you represent one-fifth of this county. So we don't need to take that baloney from them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Second it's a, thing. It's a good point. Can I... Add? Go ahead. You know, they, they came to the Board of Supervisors twice, and then the CPUC came once. And we had all these concerns about what would happen with this PSPS. And they said, oh, we will have a, a tent in Ukiah, and we'll have a charging stations, and we'll have all this stuff, and we'll, we won't tell you where it is, but CPC. it will. PG&E said, PG &E said that. The California Public Utilities Commission. And PG&E is, you know, <laughs> no, no need to explain. I've read a lot of blueprints in my time, and not one of those blueprints that was on the internet that PG&E put up, I could understand. They were so vague and not clear, and I've read lots of blueprints. And so with that, they were supposed to give us lots of notice, as much notice as possible. And then it turns out the northern part of our county, Leggett, Piercy, Whale Gulch, that whole area, they only got 12 hours of notice. And so they were very unprepared for it. And, and then the, this whole um, tent or center, yeah, that they were supposed to be putting up in Ukiah was an RV with a little 10 by 10 pop-up blue covering shade in, in that area just north, uh, near the Masonite area. It was just ridiculous how, you know, and I think that the governor got the word. You know, I got a call from a woman up in Laytonville whose son was on dialysis, and she was saying, what are we gonna do about this? That, where do we go? And, you know, when dialysis clinics don't have generators, then we've got a real problem for a lot of people who are very fragile. And, and so I think PG&E's got a, there's a reckoning to... So when you go to Washington, maybe you ought to mention this, and maybe we should try to get some grants to help set up these centers where we can set them at the substation and keep the tier ones alive. That would be good for you to mention when you go back to Washington. Yeah, and we did have two people from our county, the county council and another supervisor, go down to the CPUC meeting last week, and this is the start of their phase two about 
getting feedback about what happened during the power shutoff. And, and so we had two people go down to, to voice our objections to what happened. Okay, my next one, and I'm going to try to oh, just... I want to go if through. I can just add to that, okay. is that we also sent a letter to PG&E because the county had to spend $126,000 for generators just to keep the administrative building open in case the power shutoff happened. We spent $126,000, and we told them, you know, hey, what are you going to do? Are you going to pay us, you know, reimburse us for that cost? And they sent a letter back saying, no. <laughs> that generator is cheaper right there. In yeah. any case, I want to go to one other item. I have three items. I'll talk to you private about the last one so I don't interfere with. You guys got a, uh, and I know you voted against it and Jurdy voted against it, this satellite surveillance system in the county that the building department wants to do. Now, I'm totally against that and you, and your supervisors ought to be too because they're going to set themselves up for a lawsuit. I worked for the county for 21 years and I've seen some pretty screwy things happen in government. One of them was with one of the board of supervisors back in the 1990s doing unethical things on the computer. So that means there can be people that are looking at your home site through satellite imagery that can do unethical things that they shouldn't be doing. And I don't like somebody looking at my backyard. You might have a swimming pool and your wife might want to go out and swim naked or something. We don't need somebody looking down here, big brother looking in our backyards. I mean, they, they better watch it because this supervisor didn't get to run another term. He was basically out because of some of the unethical practices. So that could happen to anybody in any agency, whether it's a building department or whatever. I don't want somebody staring at my property through satellite technology. And that's something you really need to talk about. And I know you were against it, and Jurdy was against it, but you got three supervisors that are for it. Yeah, and that got sent off to planning and building to do more research, and then it will come back, and hopefully we'll be able to defeat it at that point, because I think that they'll find it's a lot of money for what? For the surveillance that... Um, well, you're setting what? yourself up for a lawsuit, too. You get the yeah. wrong person, you do the wrong thing to them, so. and you're going to have a lawsuit. And I don't grow drugs or illegal stuff like that, but I, I don't think anybody likes people looking in their backyard, and I don't like it. Okay. You have a quick comment, Paul, or yeah. do we get, well, I okay. Just, I just had a, a comment on that. I'm okay with satellite imagery if, you, if, you, if it's not too intrusive. I mean, if, you're, if you have uh, parameters on it to where you can see sites that are non-compliant, I'm all for that because um, that's a really good tool. Um, like John said, I mean, we don't have the capability. We're not NSA, you know, um, and uh, I, I, you're, they're not going to be looking in your backyard. I mean, in real time. But so um, what I think to, you know, we got people in here like Sarah, who's obviously putting a lot of time and effort and other people in the community that are doing the right thing and they're doing, they're going down this road, provided to happen. But we got like 90% of the county bad actors going on right now. And we're doing these guys a huge disservice by allowing these to continue without smashing this stuff. So I want to know what is the county going to do and how serious are they going to be to get rid of these people who are, have no intentions of being compliant. And I heard you guys talk about giving them maybe three years to get into compliance. Yeah, that doesn't happen in Humboldt County. And they went from 15,000, uh, 15,000, non-compliant grows to 10,000 in like a year and a half. Because they're getting serious about their environment, they're getting serious about rewarding people who are doing it right. And until we get rid of this bad element, we're not gonna, we're, it's gonna be continued violence, continued home invasions and all that stuff. So we, I wanna know what the county, when the county is gonna address these people and deal with it, so. And I guess that with, with that question, you know, it's, it's beyond the Board of Supervisors. And so it's like dealing with the sheriff, how they're going to deal with it, and then National Guard, all that stuff. And um, we're just, we're trying to create a model that people can get into the system so that they can be, you know, legal and they can do environmentally right things, be 
good actors, pay the taxes, all that. And, um, you know, the bigger picture is, is beyond. You know, I don't know the answer to that. Enforcement is, is in charge, and the Sheriff's Department is also in charge. And what Gavin Newsom did this year by sending uh, Operation uh, Green Sweep, it, was, it really did work to a degree, but it, it just, you know, we're, we still have a ton of, of uh, illegal ponds, illegal grading, illegal water diversions. I mean, it's just enormous out there. So if we want to help the county, let's deal with that stuff and reward the people who are doing it right and get them into the program. But the ones that are thumbing their nose and they're not going to become compliant, I say deal with it. And somebody's got to deal with it. Right. We have a question here. Um, <laughs> hi, John. Thank you for being hi. here tonight. I'm here to kind of talk about Measure B because I think there's a, a deadline that's coming up on October 23rd in terms of kind of choosing the site for where a new mental health facility for the county is going to be held. And so there are a number of us concerned citizens that are really hoping that the old Howard Hospital site will be considered for that new mental health facility. And I'd like to know whatever your thoughts are on that. Well, I don't know. Okay, the question is Measure B, the mental health money that we're, we're paying the taxes for. You know, what I do know is that they've accumulated over $9 million at this point. You know, we, we did buy a training facility in Redwood Valley and that cost like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, and then they want to put in another two hundred and fifty or something for for remodeling it. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I don't know where you got the October twenty third date. Well, that's when the Major B committee is meeting again, oh. and th that was the word that they gave me. And so there are a number of us who want to make a presentation at that Major B meeting, which is on October the twenty third. And so we're trying to kind of get a feel for uh, the sentiment not only of the community, and I really do have broad support for it from the community. There are a number of us that are getting together and kind of talking about how we might strategize on that. But I don't know what, the count, what, what you folks are feeling well, since you're the county-wide folks. I just talked to um, the deputy CEO this morning and said, give me the latest on this, the Measure B, in case it comes up, because it's a big issue for Willits. And so she said that... Um, and who is this by name? This is um, Janelle Rao, and she's the deputy CEO. And um, she's in bar charge of the... Because you know, I understand that Carmel Angelo was in favor of, of the Willits, Willits site. Well, let's take a step back from that. Okay. Is that right now there's an RFP uh, a request for proposal for architectural services. And they put that out there and they got two proposals back. And what that would do is look at the feasibility, design, and construction of the whole um, proposal. You know, the Measure B committee, they recommended to the board that they build a PUF unit and then a crisis residential treatment facility and a crisis stabilization unit. And so those three facilities, you know, went to the board. We approved that they do that. And then, then so now they're going to, they put this RFP out they're looking to get a, you know, a bid. I that, understand that Margie that, Handley already has bids. She already has, I mean, they had it ready to go, bring it up to compliance, and that it could be in place within 18 months. Well, what they needed to do was, what this proposal is, is that they will look at areas throughout the county, see what the best use of county land or Howard Hospital, and it's really, they're looking at a place on Orchard Street in Ukiah that the county owns now, or Howard Hospital, but then there's some other ideas about having some of the facilities over on the coast, too. So when they get this 
this bid and they hire someone to do this feasibility design and construction, you know, or do the feasibility first. And it's really to take in the pros and cons of the different sites. And if they can put all three sites together, or if they have to build different buildings, or if they can buy an old building and renovate it, or whatever they can do with that. And then, um, then after that, the, there's also a project manager that we tried to hire. And there were quite a few um, applicants last time. And then it got down to three people, and the top two people that they interviewed rejected it because it wasn't paying enough, and so they decided to open it up again. They've got 25 applicants, and they're going to paper screen them down to a handful, and hopefully we'll, I think they're doing that next week. So hopefully we'll get a project manager on board. So we need those two components before they even start thinking about whether it's Howard Hospital or Orchard Street or Fort Bragg or whatever. Does that make sense? No. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, it's a process and it's not to the point of saying Howard Hospital or nothing. It's, I think... They're talking before they even can start really building, it could be like another year. Well, if they're going to do something outside of the community, that it would be three to five years before they could, you know, uh, have something in place. And in the meantime, every person that doesn't get help here in our county goes out of the county at an expensive rate. And, uh, you know, anyway. Right. Hi. I, I um, just wanted to ask if um, you, you might be aware or if someone else is aware. I always hear about the actual building. I never heard ever that that measure uh, supplied uh, wages for county workers to actually staff it. So that's the piece that's been missing for me. I just wondered if anybody has any. Uh, that, my concern is we'll get a building and then there's no trained staff or uh, I don't know who's going to work there. Yeah, I think and right, who's going to pay for it's it? a it's a half cent tax right now, and then it um, goes off to a eighth of a cent tax, and that's ongoing for staffing. And so, part of that money of the half cent has to be used for the building, but then a part is designated for staffing too. So I I have a question related to this as well. It's been two years since Measure B passed. And what I hear you say is in two years, we're at the point where we've woken up to the idea that we need a feasibility study and a program manager. So, and I understand there was the facility in Redwood Valley. I'm not quite sure what the purpose of that facility is, training. But it seems like a long time has elapsed since the voters made, 83% of the voters voted for Measure B. And it seems like a long time, two years is a long time, that that's the point at which we are at. So my question, what can we as citizens do to move this along? And what is your plan to move this along? I know you're not on the committee. No, our representative on that committee is Jed Diamond. And I think... There is going to be a meeting this Friday with Jed Diamond um, at noon. This Friday, if anybody's interested, I can give you more information about it. Um, we may have to move the meeting. It w it's going to be at 132 East Valley, which is across the street from the post office, at 12 noon, Friday. So, so the way the whole situation with Measure B is set up is that there's this Citizens Advisory Board for Measure B, and they've been meeting for the last year and a half or so, and they recommend to the Board of Supervisors whatever they think, that the, however the money should be spent. Now, for like a year, they didn't do any there weren't any recommendations coming to the board. I went to one of their meetings and they hadn't even kind of prioritized what their 
their priorities were. And so I said, look, when, when I'm in a classroom and you know, we're trying to figure out something with 33rd graders, you say, go around the room and say, what's your favorite color or whatever. <laughs> and so I did that with, I said, hey, just tell us what your top, pro if you had to build something right now, what would you build? And then they went around the room and they said, I'd build a puff unit, I'd build a crisis stabilization unit. And when they, after they did that, then they realized that they did have this agreement that they wanted to build those top three, and it was pretty clear, and then they recommended that to the Board of Supervisors and we approved it. And then they said, okay, we need a project manager. It came to the board, we, we approved it. And then they came with this, um, the training center in Redwood Valley, and you know, I went down with the real estate person and we looked at it, Jed Diamond was there, we looked, it looked like a great deal, and so we approved it. You know, it came to the board. So that's a process. So I think um, having a meeting with Jed and, you know, is a good idea. So you know, I'd like to see this move along a lot faster than it is, but it's also we want to do the right thing, too. Yes, uh, that meeting is on Friday, and I did write a letter to the Willits Weekly that should be in the paper tomorrow, and that will have that information in it also. But anybody who wants to add their name to uh, being a supporter of having it at the Howard Hospital, please let us know, and more, than, more the better. I just have a, I haven't followed the Measure V too closely other than it, from afar, and, and it looked like it floundered pretty badly until they finally agreed thanks to you, I guess, that they actually had some common vision about these three different facilities. So where did the training facility come in? Um, that doesn't seem to have been one of the three. It's not a puff unit, it's not a crisis center, and it isn't a, a, a long-term residential facility. Right. And I, so I'm very curious of why, why this advisory committee is struggling so badly and wasting so much time and, and now seems to be doing something that wasn't even uh, part of their purpose. Well, their purpose was to figure out the mental health, you know, the spectrum of care, you know, continuum of care, they call it. Okay. And so we're trying to look at how to provide all those mental health services and then what the facilities are. So. That those three facilities are what they say is really needed for the county to provide this continuum of care for the mental health patients. Within the Measure B, what we passed was they also said that there would be a training facility built with that money. So the training facility was partly for the, the sheriff had this training facility, and it was to provide training for first responders, you know, sheriffs, police departments, fire departments, who are dealing as first responders with people with mental illness, and also for other people you know, who, are, who are out there dealing right with them. And so it's a, it's a facility that they can do their trainings, and they can have video screens and all that, and and um, provide this training, which they don't have a place for normally. And so that was written into the Measure B language. So regardless of what we do with the PUF unit and the crisis stabilization at Howard Hospital, that this training facility was in the language. So, so that's how we got it. Well, we, yeah, we have the, we know what the money is well, we know right that, now, and it's yeah. accumulating at a half a million dollars a month. That's awesome. I just want to see so. the business plan. What do you mean when yeah. you say the business? Well, I want to see their, I want to see their projected goals. I want to see their, their. Uh, it's a business model. I mean, it's they, they've got to have a plan for this thing. There's got to, there's got to be goals, and there's got to be interim uh, uh, goals met. 
and um, we, we want to see how that's the progress of this of this particular. Well, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we'd they, like to see that. They did do this Kemper report, and Kemper was the one who came in and looked at the whole continuum of care and said, "This is what you need to do for the county, and this is how you spend the money." And he laid it all out. And then the Measure B got kind of bogged down into whether they're actually going to adhere to that, the Kemper report or not. And I think they went round and round about that. And so finally, the Board of Supervisors passed a motion just about a month ago saying, you know, we think that you should be following the Kemper report. And that laid out the whole kind of the business plan about how the money would be spent, how they would get from here to there. So maybe we could be caught up to speed on where we're at in the progress and when what has been accomplished for the amount of yeah. Go so where? John. No, I just want to see. I want to see the written. They got to have something written. Yeah, just yeah. it's got to be on the internet or it's got to be. Somewhere where we can act. John, do they have you, it at the library, the Kemper Report? I, I don't know, but I think that the, there is a website on the county website right. about it, Measure B. It's kind of like building a house. You get plans, and then you, you meet the plans, and you meet the project, and there's, a, there's an end date, to, to, you know, to at least interimly. I mean, I know this thing changes a little bit because of the parameters of the... the uh, um, scope of it but I mean we we should I mean it doesn't sound like anybody in here knows anything about the progress do we it's John I have a quick question say. John I have a quick question on that same topic you know when we when this measure came to the voters it was sold to us as uh, basically a puff unit so that Mendocino County residents wouldn't be shipped out of county that's how it was sold and people voted for it. Then once it was approved, then suddenly the whole thing morphed into this, this huge enterprise with all these facilities and it, 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 uh, it was like a bait and switch enterprise in my view. And, um, and I've heard rumors that they're talking about shipping in mental health patients from other areas to help fund it. So, so the, uh, all of that in my view is, is uh, contrary to what the voters thought they were putting money toward. Uh, uh, we didn't hear about any of these other facilities. It was basically a puff unit. And, uh, and suddenly it's morphed into this, uh, this huge uh, uh, enterprise, uh, you know, with the training and all these other units um, that have been added to it. Now maybe, uh, so it was approve the money, sell it uh, first, and then suddenly, uh, you know, the details of, of what we purchased um, changed dramatically. And I think it's kind of unfair to, it's unfair and, and irresponsible to, to do it that way. Um, I don't know what can be done about it, but, uh, but I'll tell you, I would not vote for a sales tax project uh, under, uh, if this same uh, uh, strategy comes forward. You vote for something, you think you're voting for one thing, and then suddenly it, it morphs into this completely different thing. Uh, and there's no evidence, I, I see no evidence that that half cent sales tax can pay for this huge uh, enterprise that's being contemplated. Um, uh, does the county even know whether they can or not? I don't know, but uh, but I'm kind of upset that uh, with the bait and switch strategy, and uh, I'm not going to vote for sales tax and, uh, unless there are firm ideas on what we're paying for and what we're not paying for. Well, on that line is that we did do measure A for the libraries, and that's been very successful in keeping the libraries open and funded properly. You know, and certainly the libraries have a lot of more needs than then we can even address with the Measure A money. With this Measure B money, you know, I think the puff unit was the thing that we all bought into, right? But when they did this continuum of care study, they said that, you know, if you have these people who 
go into a puff unit, but they have to be released quickly into, and so what do you do with them? They're in the puff unit, and I, I'm not sure, but they can only stay there for a certain number of hours. But what we need to do is do this feasibility study to see how much money we have and what we can build with it, and then figure out if those top priority buildings, those are our top three, do those first, and then whatever money we have left, if there is money, then you go off and you start doing the other things. But without, I think they, they realize with this study that if you just do the puff unit, that's not going to solve the problem. You need to do these crisis stabilization units to get the people out of the emergency rooms, and you need to, and that could just be a small building. Is there a timeline for this feasibility study, and does the feasibility study include the cost component as well as the environmental and geographic suitability of various locations? What does it, this study encompass? It will, it will look at all those things. And they need to get the person, you know, that's, they're looking at these proposals right now. They've got the two proposals to, to get in there to hire the people that can do those studies. And they'll look at the cost, they'll look at the suitability, the, the area of coverage, all that. And so that's what they're doing with that suitability study. The training facility, yeah, it cost a quarter million dollars. No, it cost... Well, that's a proposal, but it hasn't gone to the board yet. And they also wanted 35000 for a sound system for this little conference room C. Oh, no. at the <laughs> and so... So anyway, that's, I'm drawing the line there. The room is, it's a pretty small room. And there's 12 people on that, the committee, Measure B committee. And, and my wife, Janice, who teaches third grade right now, third through fifth grade, you know, she, when she had a student who couldn't hear well, you know, that they had a sound system kind of like this, you know, the Madonna look. And, um, and that they would, you know, it would create a sound system. They'd have speakers in different corners of the room. And I think it, no, it cost, what, $500 or something? Something around 500 And I'm saying, hey, that's what you should do. And I went to the informational services, the, the IS department of the county the other day, and I said, look, how'd you get 35000 well, if everyone has a wireless mic and it's $4,000 for a set of four and you need, you know, it was like, I said, you know, that's, it's not happening. I'm not going to vote for it, okay? I'm not going to be voting for the $35,000 sound system. Or, and I still need, I need to find out a lot more about what renovations they want to do with that training facility because it was a perfectly fine building, exactly. and I can, I can see ten, twenty thousand or something. But we need to see what, what it actually is. Okay, John. So my question is: used to be between General Services and the Sheriff's Department, a pretty good sized piece of property there. And as the Sheriff Department is getting involved in training to help this mental facility, why wouldn't they build it right there on their own land? the facility right in Ukiah, because I know there's a lot of people in Willits that's concerned with Bechtel Grove School being so close. At least down there you have the Sheriff's Department right there in case something gets out of hand and it becomes a hazardous situation. You have the Sheriff's Department with a lot more people to help calm the situation down. You already have the property there. Unless something's been built since the last time I've been there, there was a great big vacant lot between General Services and the Sheriff's Department. Why don't they use their own land instead of buying more? Well, that's where the new jail is going. Anyway. Um, well, a quick comment, and my, my two cents on this part of the agenda is that um, I agreed with what uh, Sherry said, is about it seems like the committee should have identified what they hired Kemper to do. They should have identified what they needed and then they should have hired a feasibility study for the, how much does it cost and what are the different sites they could be at? 
a year and a half ago. But anyway, at least they're sort of doing it now. Um, but it's, it is very um, frustrating for the public. Um, can I change the subject? <laughs> Are we ready? Uh, oh, okay. I want to answer John's concern about the location as far as the schools are concerned. I met with Mark Westenberg, our superintendent of schools, last week to talk about that because I had heard that people were concerned that the schools were so close to the hospital. And this is what Mark Westenberg said. I could almost quote him in saying, do you know how many hours a day the school is open? Do you know how many days a week the school is open? Do you know how many weeks a year the school is open? You know how many months a year a school is open? He said, we can secure our schools. We are not worried. We have a very good working relationship with the police department, with the sheriff's department, and we're far more concerned about the people who are out on the streets right now. We need a health facility 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And he said, the school itself actually owns property that they are trying to rezone uh, hopefully, it's now industrial, but they would like to zone that 10 acres that they have behind the kids' club into residential, and he feels like it would not only be a good residential area for our new hospital, but also for a mental health facility. So the schools are not objecting, and he said he'd be willing to certainly talk to the Major B people or anybody else if they're having concerns about the schools. So the other measure... V, <laughs> which always sounds like B, but it's V, um, has been in um, limbo for three and a half years, actually. It was passed in June of 2016, and it hasn't yet been enforced at all. Um, measure V was the uh, measure that was to make, um, declare that killing, intentionally killing and leaving standing dead trees for more than three months was a public hazard, um, that it is causing the uh, severe fire hazard. And we know that we have fire hazard here. So anyway, um, that was the premise of Measure V. There was a, a pretty good analysis by uh, former um, county council, Kit, uh, Catherine Elliott, in which she explain, you know, why it could be considered legal and why some people are saying they don't, that, you know, Mendocino Redwood and Company is saying it isn't legal to enforce it because they are forestry, which is under agriculture, which the county can't enforce, which, but Kit, El Kit Elliott's analysis shows that it could, in fact, be perfectly legal for the county to enforce this measure that was passed by the voters pretty overwhelmingly. I know that it has um, been bounced around at the board level. And after three and a half years, it just seems like that's an awfully long time to bounce this thing around and avoid it uh, because you're afraid of MRC. And I know you're an advocate for getting on with enforcing Measure V, but. Um, what do we, the public, need to do to get the board to simply uh, direct staff to enforce it? Period. I mean, if you pass an ordinance, you would expect your staff to enforce it. If the public passes an ordinance, you should also have it enforced. Yeah, so. that's this, um, you know, the Measure V, which is a hack and squirt issue. And... <clears throat> You know, the Board of Supervisors a couple of years ago sent it off to the state attorney general to get an opinion. And then finally, in what, July, June, I think, sometime around then, that they came back and said that they weren't, go August, they weren't going to get involved in it and that they, they had a conflict of interest. And so, so they said, it's up to you guys. And so we've been making some movement. We actually, we sent a, well, we're sending a letter to MRC because they had written a letter saying <clears throat> that the county didn't have the right to enforce Measure B. And the county council's response was that, 
you know, we didn't, or the county council's letter to the estate attorney general was laying out this case that we did have a right to enforce it. And that, um, so now that the, the board said to our county council and the CEO, we want you to respond to MRC and tell them basically that we feel like we can enforce it and that we want to create a win-win situation because they've got all these tan oak trees out there that lots of people say, oh, we can use the tan oaks to create um, pellet fuels or um, you know, flooring or, you know, th there's lots of ideas out there that people have to use this tan oak in a productive way rather than just cutting them, you know, injecting an herbicide into them and leave them standing until they kind of decompose. And so, so we're sending that letter off to MRC and um, supervisor, well, there, it's a question of getting three people to vote to implement it. And so, so I don't know if we're there right now. You know, at the last board meeting, I wanted to do a study on how to, I wanted to send it off to staff to, um, to look at how to implement it, how, what it would be the mechanics of implementing Measure B and the cost. And so that didn't get passed and we're regrouping. I think if people go to the board and really demand that we... Um, we bring it up as an issue and just vote it whether we're implementing it or not. That might be the way to go. So that the board is put on record of saying, this is what we want to do. This is just like every other ordinance we have. You know, if there's a complaint, you enforce it. Yeah, Naomi? Is the um, westernmost subdivision, um, West Willits, um, out Sherwood Road, and it abuts <clears throat> MRC land? Um, by the way, they're logging out there to beat the band. <laughs> I don't think there's going to be a, a, a big tree left standing, um, and I can just hear it every day for the last three weeks. Um, and I look out on a view of Hack and Squirt. I see those dead trees, and I've been watching them as they go through their, their process of deterioration. It takes years, and I now realize that these gray areas that I used to see on the mountains uh, going over to Fort Bragg, that's also Hack and Squirt. It's hack and squirted all over the county. There are swaths of dead standing trees. And people are taking, this, I hear this, you know, because this is an issue I've been really, really upset about for a long time. Um, I hear people saying, well, um, you know, Measure B only says they, they have to um, not kill and leave dead standing trees within a thousand feet of structures or whatever. And so, um, you know, this is clearly more than a thousand feet. But the fire can travel so fast over those distances. There was a fire that could have eaten up Ukiah last year right, out on um, Low Gap Road. And we've just been lucky. And for MRC to continue to say that this is not a fire hazard is just mind-boggling. It's crazy-making. I think we need Measure B so we can deal with Measure V. Because <laughs> it makes you insane. Um, <laughs> And so when I hear all this parsing, I've been to the supervisors numerous times. People have gone there every meeting just about or every other meeting, and we haven't mobbed the supervisors. We've gone, you know, just a couple of people. Not everybody needs to spend gas and time going down there. But for the first eight months, it was, oh, we have to wait for the AG's office. And then when that convenient excuse went away, it was, oh, well, I guess we have to do something. But nothing has happened. And I'm really, I'm sorry, but I don't appreciate, I don't understand why you introduced a motion to send it to committee to study a fiscal impacts statement that could be attached to it. That just seems like it burdens the initiative process even more. So I'm hoping that that will go away, and I know that you do have a strategy for that. Um, at the same time, I don't, you know, we have these standing committees that are never activated, or I shouldn't say never, but for the last two years, I don't think the standing committee has met. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's sort of like... What standing committee? That would be the governmental committee that you sent oh. the, the Measure V. Yeah, we just met to. last month for the first time since I've been on the board. When did you meet? The, the standing committee? Last month. Well, um, correct me again yeah. if I'm wrong, but I believe that those standing committees are open to public and need to be publicly noticed. 
Yeah. So do you intend to notice a meeting of the standing committee that you sent the Measure V issue to for fis fiscal impact? Well, it didn't get sent to the standing committee for fiscal impact. No, the, stand, no, the governmental committee to consider oh. the, the idea that you introduced. Of, well, actually, I, I think it was John McGowan that asked for, that said that we, it's a problem for the county to um, act on an initiative without knowing how much it's going to cost. And so this gets into the whole rigmarole of, on the one hand, people argue, the supervisors argue that they can't, they can't enforce V because there's no enforcement mechanism. Well, I don't think there has to be an enforcement mechanism. It's a county code issue. At the same time, they, are, they argue that enforcement is too expensive. Well, the only, re only real expense would be because Mendocino Redwood County Redwood Company refuses to comply. Otherwise, it would be minimal. It wouldn't be a problem, I don't think. Right, if they because were they complying, would stop do, if they would comply with the law. So, number one, right. I would like to know when you're planning to put this back on the agenda because people have been very frustrated that every time it comes up, it's like, oh, well, we'll just deal with it in this way. So you guys don't have to come down here. Um, and so people are like, all right, we, you know, we'll, we'll be patient. But I think we've been patient too long. And it's only a matter of time before a spark from lightning or a spark from logging equipment yeah. lights I think up the fire. That, so are well, you going to, I want to know, first of all, three things. Are you going to open that committee? Um, are you going to call a stand committee meeting to deal with the Measure V thing that you sent to them? First. Okay. But that part of my motion did not get passed. It lost you, three to clarify? two. My motion was to send it off, send Measure V to the general government standing committee to look at the mechanism, how we would enforce Measure V, and the cost. And so we could get that information back, thinking that that might be able to persuade some of the other supervisors to vote in favor of it. But we didn't even get that passed. Okay? What we did pass was this motion to look at cost of future initiatives and the cost to them. And so there would be a cost analysis associated with future initiatives. And that's being sent off to the, the standing committee on general, the general government standing committee on October 21st. So it does not apply to Measure V? That what? It doesn't apply retroactively. No. Okay. I still want to say, and then I'll leave that topic, that I think it's a very bad idea to attach fiscal impact statements to initiatives because then the supervisors, the reason for an initiative, the reason it arises is because the supervisors or the, the elected representatives aren't expressing and acting on the will of the people. That's why citizens have to do initiatives. So if it's subject to the supervisors, elected officials just saying, well, that's too expensive, and they get to set up the criteria of how much it would cost, kiss it goodbye. Okay. So then, you need to be there on October 21st at 1.30. As usual. It's okay. getting pretty tiresome. And my other question yeah. is, um, when will it be on the agenda? And can we please have enough lead time so that we can... Measure organize? V? Measure V. When does that come back onto the agenda so that the I think public can the, go there and weigh in? The plan and is not, for not it to be on comment. the agenda on November 19th, I think. It wouldn't... Ted Williams was not aware that there was a date. He told us there would be one in November, and we don't know when. So I'd like to confirm that. Yeah. Can so, you tell me when, when that's going to be? I haven't confirmed anything. So, but that was the idea I had well, for it's been November been requested 19th. numerous times, please put that issue on the agenda. It's been requested at, at public comment. It's been requested in emails. We need it to be on the agenda so that the public can show up in a timely manner, not next Tuesday, you know, which is how much notice we got for the last time it came up. You need to have a timely you know, notice of when it will be on the agenda and be able to rely on that. We can ask that it be on a specific date. We have another okay. question Thank you. back I'm, here. I'm, I'm, I have, and then and I'll, I'll yield. Um, I would like to suggest that um, we call for a moratorium 
on MRC's practices of uh, hack and squirt until the matter is adjudicated. Mm. Yes. Okay. Another question here. Um, I'm not sure if what she just said is what I'm about to say, but I've been using um, Humboldt Redwood Company and Medicina Redwood Company products thinking that they were actually responsible um, corporations that are local and I felt pretty good about it when I looked on their website. So if, uh, if I'm the last uninformed consumer in the room, you can just forget what I'm about to say. But if you feel there are others like me, um, maybe a consumer information um, campaign would work and we could boycott their products. I don't know if, 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 if their local market is enough to affect their bottom line, but it'd be great for more people to learn about their practices and how it's affecting our county. Yeah, so I have this phone conference with this professor from UC Davis next week. And that's something that we can bring up and see what his thoughts are. To, but it, it does have to expand you know, for different jurisdictions. I'm all for it, but okay. Oh. <clears throat> something just to consider for the county. Um, I mean, we've lost so many economic engines in this county. We're already, I mean, we're, we're in a position right now where how are we going to generate fiscal, uh, you know, products? How are we going to generate capital to subsidize our tax necessities and our tax base in the county? If we, if we want to put a moratorium on one of the biggest employers and one of the biggest companies that is an economic engine on the coast, which is timber, um, we're going we're gonna to seal the fate of the county yet again by cutting off another economic engine. So my, my thoughts to the county is this. We need timber practices. We need forest health. We need silvicultural models that not only just leave the, the forest to a late successional state, which creates fire, cat catastrophic fire conditions, but we need to be thinning the forest. We need to be rejuvenating the forest. We need to be, this is my opinion, that the county should look into when we have the old, what was that, PILT? Came in with the programs where we harvested timber from the public lands, which, which created forest health. It, it created new vegetation, new seral vegetation for, for wildlife. The deer population right now in the, in the public lands is 75% is in decline because of the decadent habitat. So if we want to kill off all the wildlife and we want to kill off our industry, more, the, the place that we're going to be heading to if we continue to kill off economic engines um, I think we just need to manage these engines so that they, cre that they create uh, health for both sides of the fence. And so um, the county should look at forest health with regards to the public lands, which mitigate fire, catastrophic fires by thinning and by rejuvenating that. And it, it creates uh, a good environment for everything to survive out there. So. Right. What we're trying to do, well, with this letter was to, to have them stop the hack and squirt, but also look at, you know, where can we work together to have economic development, create jobs for our rural areas. Yeah. You know, I think it, there's a win-win there, and we just need to start talking as a, in that way. So I guess Dan. my question would be on that account, why are, your, why are you pandering to a proven renegade corporate entity, MRC? That would be my question. And, and why is it that you're going out of your way to be sure that they stay solvent? Um, yeah, I, I heard what this, this gentleman said, and that's all fine. And if you've got a company that's up and up, that's one thing. But I want to tell you, this idea of the public all, um, having to come before the supervisors before any movement uh, of uh, any important uh, takes place. The public has already come before the supervisors. They came with their vote at 62 percent. That should be enough for movement. You shouldn't have to do any more than that. You need to, uh, I think, be responsible. Now, here's the deal. <clears throat> you and I, John, we've lived in this community, you your whole life, me, for 48 years, right? And, you know, and you learn in that period of time that uh, you're privy to information through the grapevine here and there, and you hear about things going on here and things going on there, you know, if you're, you know, been a part of the community for a while. 
So my question to you is, did you know that Mendocino Redwood Company, in recent past, has clear-cut 11,114 acres? That's my question to you. Did you know that? No. Okay, neither did I. In Mendocino County? In Mendocino County. So, I've got your, your brochure here in this little statement, you know, that says that you are going to protect our forests. That's why I voted for you. One reason I voted for you. That's why I've come up before you before in our last uh, public meeting, and, and this one as well. And uh, where we left off last time was my emphasizing to you the importance of knowing what's really going on in our redwood forests. Okay, and getting some neutral entities out there and some science out there to see what's actually going on. Because I'm worried that we're going to wake up one day and our forests are going to be decimated, they're going to be deforested. That was what I came to you with before I had this information even. Okay, and this information didn't come just from me. This, this came from uh, Mike Adair's uh, front page article. Uh, and. I already gave him one, but I'm moving. Okay, do you, want, do you want to respond to that first? I already asked him if he knew, and he didn't know. So I want to verify that by telling you that um, uh, there's a, a 2017 audit. There's, let me say this. This is this article that was written by Mike Adair, okay, in the last week's Will It's Weekly. And in that, the headline reads, Mendocino Redwood Cut Remains Low, okay? What they don't say is that the data for that is all taken off of Mendocino Redwood Company's website, okay, and there's no validation for it. Well, I have, I have a comment on that, too, because I was at the Board of Supervisors meeting with all the fire chiefs came to you, the Board of Supervisors and testified about uh, hack and squirt and the danger they have, and they, there were families there talking about the firefighters, the young firefighters getting sick from going into fires in clear-cut area because of the toxins that were put on the tree. And now that the, the whole Mendocino complex of fire chiefs and their staff are not really willing to go in and fight fires in the clear-cut or the hack and squirt areas because of the toxicity and there are five firefighters dying from their conditions that they've acquired fighting those fires in the hack and squirt toxic areas. That is one of the issues, and, and I just learned this morning, too, that Cal OSHA won't let firefighters go into these dead standing trees because of the danger. So anyway, Dan, did you have a question? I think that's what people want to know is the question instead of reading the paragraph. Yeah, okay. So you weren't aware of the clear cut? No. What do you think about that? The 11,000 acres of clear cut. Yeah, I think that's certified. And clear cutting was supposed to be done in this county. Oh. We fought that years ago. Yeah. Well, I'll have to look at that. But we do have a climate action advisory committee forming, and Walter Smith, who is a forestry expert, is my appointment to that. You know, hopefully they'll be able to look at that stuff. So, so I don't. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly right. Meanwhile, you, they may be clear cutting right now, and we don't know it because they, they hid it from their own certifiers. Either they hid well, it or they were co conspirators in hiding it. And okay, if you can send me that information, that'd be good. How about you guys sit down? Okay. Hi, I, I just wanted to ask a question of how about some unemployment services here in Willits? So we don't have to go all the way to Ukiah to obtain uh, employment services in a, an office that moved to a remote part of North Gate Street. And it was really inconvenient to get to. Right. Thank that, you. That's a good point. And it's uh, unemployment services. And <clears throat> I, I sit on that board, but not on the local board, the regional board for the of Workforce Alliance, North Bay Workforce Alliance, and that's what oversees the what's the career point. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So um, you know, I can pass it on that 
it'd be good to have services here. One thing I've been working on is career and technical education for this area. I met a couple weeks ago with Senator Mike McGuire and I'm the county superintendent of schools, and we're going to look at, I wrote it in my, um, my article this week, or that will be next week, but we're looking at where we are in the county about you know, training, what we need, where we want to go, and how we're going to get there. And so we're going to have a series of meetings, and hopefully we can make some movement on that, because I think career and technical education is really important in this area to have people, you know, get fulfilling jobs. And, you know, I hear a lot of people who, you know, I've been talking to these people, I've been touring these machine shops and everything, and people are, you know, these owners are looking for people to work for them. And they can't find real trained people, so they're not able to scale up their businesses. So, so anyway, I'll pass that on. I, uh, I want to say that one way to encourage MRC to, I, I mean, I think enforcing Measure V would probably be the most effective thing the county could do to get MRC to change some of their practices, such as the poisoning of the trees that are making, you know, toxic conditions for workers and for people who live nearby. So. So you as a supervisor have a golden opportunity to actually push MRC to do the right thing. And I think that would be more effective than a letter uh, suggesting that perhaps that we could work out some kind of a win-win. I mean, the supervisors could enforce the will of the people, and that will push MRC into, into heading, off, heading in the right direction, looking at something to do differently with their tan oaks. So... Um, that's one thing. The other thing is, when the general government committee meets, I hope that, and maybe you can tell me what you plan to do, but my hope is that this idea of requiring an economic analysis of all future initiatives will be, will be killed absolutely with a stake in its heart because that would be a terrible thing to do to the people of Mendocino County to add that burden to passing a, a citizen initiative. So I'm counting on you, John, to, to kill that thing dead. Yeah, after um, it got brought up without any, without any um, preview to, at the board meeting. And when it got brought up, then it got approved and sent off to the standing government general government committee, like you know, and uh, it, with reflection, I don't think it's a good idea. So I'm going to do what I can to, to stop that because, you know, my understanding is it's very hard to get citizens' initiatives passed and the whole process, and if people feel like the, the county can be manipulating that, you know, then the, the county is setting themselves up for lawsuits when they become the arbiter of how much it's actually going to cost, or, you know. Question over anyway. here. Right yeah. Here. Oh. Right here. Oh. Hi, John. Uh, Jim Simpson. Uh, Supervisor Williams brought up the question in regards to the permitting process, something we've heard multiple times through tonight with both cannabis, but just as a general homeowner, um, you've been working with me on a discussion with the Department of Transportation and, an, and encroachment permit. Within our county, we do not have any access as the public to really go on and find out how much a permit may cost, what the requirements of permits. You go to our county website and it is pretty much a phone number list with occasionally a person that may or may not still work there. Um, you know, moving forward, will you support the county becoming more online? Um, I know Supervisor Williams brought up our county building permit, you know, how it's discouraged a lot of companies from in coming into our county. Uh, new housing, which is an, a giant issue. Um, you know, it, it seems to make people, so we go through hearsay of what somebody said. Um, in some cases, county personnel may make up their minds of how they want it to go, and it may not be something that you as a board approve or not. 
Right, so I totally support that going online with some of these issues, you know, in the permit process. And, and you know, I've been kind of shocked that, to find out that a lot of these, these permit applications aren't online. So, you know, it seems the county staff as well as county departments seem to be making their own rules when it comes to what fees are. They could adjust it by the person if they, for some reason, have any issues with that person, whether it be a homeowner, whether it be somebody trying to build a business in our community, or whatever, just a property owner trying to do property maintenance. The accountability is lackluster in this county with, in regards to some of these issues. Yeah. And so the, the fee structure should be laid out, but if you're having a problem with it, let me know. And we're going to, we'll be talking. Right. Right. So, and I appreciate that. The idea about the, uh, putting it online and um, uh, the whole process itself. Yeah, Naomi. I'm sorry to go back to Mr. V, but you just made a really important comment that just kind of trickled away there. And I appreciate people's comments that we shouldn't have to keep going back to the Board of Supervisors to just to make sure that we even get this on the, in, on the agenda, that we went to the ballot and the people have spoken. But you just mentioned that um, there's this fear of lawsuit that MRC will, will sue. And we keep hearing that as a rumor. But as I understand it, if MRC has actually made a credible threat of a lawsuit, then the supervisors should have gone or would have been supposed to have gone into closed session to talk about that threat. But yet, to my knowledge, they haven't. If they have, I'd like to know. And if they haven't, then why? Why keep bringing up this fear of a lawsuit if MRC, and to my research, I don't see where they've actually said that. They've just insinuated it. They've just said, we won't comply because now we're forestry, now we're agriculture. It depends which one. For certification purposes, they changed their status as foresters to agriculture to get around that. And so when you read that article in the Willits Weekly, definitely take that with a big grain of salt. There's a lot in there that there's more to that story. But I mean, we need to get to the bottom of this with this thing about the lawsuit. If they're really going to sue, then that's intimidation. Of course, that's the letter of the day, but um, yeah. <laughs> nationally and locally. But if they're not, then go ahead and enforce or let the people know because this whole thing about the cost of enforcement is a red herring. There's no great cost unless you have to enforce it on non-compliant entities. And I'm sorry, but a lot of these bad growers that are out of compliance that don't happen to have $100,000 lying around so they can get into compliance, you know, we're so worried about them. But MRC can go ahead and poison the county and set it on fire. Okay? And yeah. we keep talking about the deer problem. There's not, you know, the, the deer population is way down. Well, I'll tell you where there's a lot of deer in Spring Creek in the subdivision that I live in that's bordering on MRC land because all the animals come up to us because that's where we have acorns because we didn't poison our trees. They eat acorns. It's not just about us humans. It's not just about fire danger for us. It's about all the animals there, all the creatures that depend on that. That's the habitat that they are erasing so they can make board feet. We need to reduce our dependency on wood for building greatly in this age of climate change. And we need to protect the acorns. That's a cultural issue. That's cultural genocide that's going on there when those acorns are poisoned. Okay? So okay. when we talk about, I'm sorry, this is a little bit of a filibuster. When we talk about, we have to talk about Measure V only in terms of fire danger. But someone mentioned where the, the intersection is, is in the smoke. That's where the toxics affect everybody. So when MRC says, oh, you, we can't regulate toxics, you know, because that's been taken away from us. That's their way of dead-ending us. Well, right? Naomi, do so you we, have I a... need to know, my question is, yeah, okay. are you aware of a credible threat of a lawsuit from MRC? Since I've been on the board, we haven't had a credible threat that we've had a, a closed session meeting concerning that. So I think that maybe before 
when MRC wrote their original letter, there was a, that was considered a threat. As it stands now, according to the sheriff, we had a kind of a long conversation just not that long ago. Um, he has indicated, and I saw a little burp in the paper about it, uh, the high-low siren that'll be used. Right. That is differentiated from other sirens so that people will know it's time to get out, time to get out now. And uh, my suggestion to him was to have personnel down at Sherwood Road at every outlet to give people guidance as to which way to go. And he seemed to come up with this idea of uh, sandwich boards mm -hmm. because he doesn't have the personnel to do that, although he liked the idea and would consider a citizen's group to do that. So that's all stuff that's kind of in the works. So what I'm getting at, my question to you is, with the advent of the helicopter in Santa Rosa with a siren on it, which will be used in places where the sheriff's cars can't get with, with the sirens, so that everybody will get the siren. Because we need that siren to be the same siren, the same high-low as the sheriff's high-low sirens, for one thing. Okay, they need to be coordinated so everybody knows that what's going on. Do you understand what I'm saying there? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, we also, I think, and this is my question to you, is there a way that you can help to disseminate to the public uh, in a blanket way that this is occurring so that everybody knows? Because all I saw was a little blurb in the Willits News. I haven't heard anything on KZYX or anywhere else about uh, the high-low siren. And I'm thinking people really need to be informed uh, about that and thoroughly informed to where maybe some kind of campaign so that people know that that does exist and, and what to do in that case. Could, is that something you could implement or help along? Yeah, I've been going to all the Sherwood Firewise Council meetings and telling them about it, and they're getting the word out. So, um, you know, I can go back to the Office of Emergency Services and tell them that they should get the word out, you know, that they should remind people at least. John, what about real sirens? Well, they've done, they've done some studies. They did a study over in Navarro Ridge, I guess, and they, which is kind of similar to Brook Trails area, and they found that the sirens didn't really work. You know, that their, their coverage was very sporadic, that because of the topography, that it didn't work well. So they were thinking that you know, the sirens on the cars and maybe the Civil Air Patrol coming over would be a better evacuation zone. But I did get this group together a couple months ago of all the first responders and the ambulance, the fire departments, the sheriff's department, the Office of Emergency Services. There was like 15 people in the room up in Brook Trails. And one of the things they were talking about was uh, evacuation zones. And they hadn't shared their information about evacuation zones in a long time. And so because of that meeting, they started sharing that information. And that's what the sheriff's department wanted from the fire departments. And so I felt like, hey, we're making a few steps forward. Getting you know, everybody and, on the same page. Right. Yeah, that's right. good. That's a good thing. So glad to hear that. But you know that big fire they have on Route 80 yesterday down in the Bay Area? You could yeah. hear that siren from the plant alerting that community all the way up onto Route 80 where the newscaster was. And to put an exclamation mark on what she just said, I've lived in Spring Creek for decades, and it used to be a siren in Brook Trails near the offices there uh, that would go off every day at noon, and I could hear, I'm probably three miles away, and I could hear, as the crow flies, and I could hear that siren every day. Yeah. That whole thing about, you know, yeah, but people, people up in Brook Trails can hear, could hear the mill siren down here in the middle of town. Right. Right here. Well, I was just going to add that there actually was a fairly extensive online presence from the Sheriff's Department with some samples of that siren and what it sounds like. And <clears throat> so that, I, I saw that online. It's out the there. The high-low. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, John, for your time here and the excellent job you're doing on the board. And uh, I have two short questions for you, but I need a, a, to give you a little bit of background. And it's regarding the ambulance services and the contract with the county. 
And this is uh, Chief Wilkes, the Willits uh, <laughs> Little Lake uh, Fire Department chief. Um, re regarding the contract for the ambulance service, uh, this newspaper article is from the September 26th. The RFPs were due September 3rd. And so the fire chief is commenting here, okay, as of September 26th, we still don't know, and now I'll just read, as of September 3rd, proposals were due for companies interested in providing the service. September 3rd has come and gone. The county fire departments don't know what happened. To this date, even with multiple emails coming from multiple fire districts, the county has remained 100% silent, said Wilkes. We have no idea if one or 10 or nobody put in for the RFP, uh, to, for the RFP. I'm on the technical advisory committee and they won't answer my emails either. The executive office has left us completely blank on the EMS, uh, on the EMS side. We don't know anything more than we did before other than Ukiah has officially backed out of the process and went so far as to send a cease and des desist letter to the county. My whole thing here is about the performance of the county CEO. So that letter, that's just like embarrassing that the CEO cannot even give fundamental information like, yeah, we did receive some proposals or we didn't, you know, like absolutely no response. But I've heard this from other people about the county ex executive office. And so um, um, in addition to that in, uh, incident, we have the whole cannabis program disaster that's just been an embarrassing disaster. The revolving door personnel at key departments. We have a revolving county council office, a revolving planning director office, a revolving county commissioner office, a revolving health and human services director uh, uh, situation. The county morale is, is poor, and this is even after the pay raise, the, the county morale is poor. And uh, I, I've never heard leadership and Carmel Angelo in the same sentence. And so I, my question is, I feel that this, our current CEO is not accountable for anything, and she's making a, a fairly good, a quite a good salary. So my question is, when does her contract come up, and does the public have input on her performance? I think her contract goes for another three years. Uh -huh. They approved it before I got on the board. Uh -huh. And um, the public input would be through oh, supervisors. Okay. Oh, right, great. Okay. But well, I'll, I'll say this is that I've had good experiences with the CEO's office and the oh, I'm CEO. Glad to hear that. And okay. I think that she's been supportive of what I've been trying to do. So that's. Okay. That's what I'm going well, off of. I'm, I'm glad and, to hear that. Okay. Yeah. And with the EMS situation, I have had several meetings with Chief Wilkes from the Little Lake Fire Department mm -hmm. and Chief Neuer, and we've the three of us have sat down a couple times, and we've talked about the EMS situation and the. It's a, it's a very long, it difficult is. It conversation. Is. It is. But I know it just, is. Just yes. Just know that we're working on it and we're in communication. Very okay, very good. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. You're welcome. So anyway, thank you all for coming. This is really democracy in action, and, and I appreciate it. And thanks again to Sherry and Judy and AAUW for all they've done. <laughs>